The evidence is all here in the special edition two DVD set of Court TV's Forensic Files. It's 12 episodes of the scientific smash full of newly revealed behind the scenes footage, photos, and the interactive forensics lab. Track down Court TV's Forensic Files DVD at courttv.com slash store. Three men of privilege abusing their power. They didn't believe that the laws applied to them. Unbridled greed, wanting things that were above and beyond what people should should have. They built an empire. Been transporting on a large scale cocaine and marijuana. Planes full. And watched it crumble. They hated each other's guts by the end. Nothing has ever happened in Lexington before or since with as much drama, tragedy, intrigue as what happened with this group of people. Crooked cops, cocaine, and conspiracy as blue bloods go bad. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. September morning in 1985, an elderly man steps out of his Knoxville, Tennessee home and discovers the broken body of a parachutist in his driveway. There is a large duffel bag strapped to the body. The chute strapped to his back is unopened. There was no indication that he had even pulled his cord. When authorities arrived, they discovered that inside the duffel bag was almost 80 pounds of cocaine, an amount then worth $15 million. 70 miles away in the Nantahila Forest in North Carolina, park rangers come upon a plane that has crashed into the side of a mountain. Although no one is on board, a trail of jettison duffel bags on the ground marks the plane's crooked path from Georgia to Tennessee to North Carolina. Each of the bags is filled with cocaine. When investigators identify the body, they discover that the man doesn't fit the normal profile for a drug smuggler. He is Andrew Thornton, a former Lexington, Kentucky police officer and a scion of a successful horse breeding family. It was shocking, but it was only the tip of the iceberg. Andrew Thornton had been at the center of a web of corruption that stretched back 15 years. It was the story of greed, violence, and three old friends from Kentucky, drunk with power, who left a trail of mayhem in their wake. Andrew Thornton was born in 1944 and was raised in the upper tier of Kentucky society. His parents owned a horse breeding farm just outside of Lexington. It was one of the better farms, and it did have a good role in the horse breeding industry. In their inventory, I would say that there was a hefty investment of money there. He came from a family of privilege and always seemed to be something of um, a daredevil growing up. At 14, Thornton was sent to the Suwannee Military Academy in Tennessee, a private school designed to instill well-brought-up boys with the ethics of serious young men. At Swanee, he ran into Bradley Bryant, another boy from a prominent Lexington family. Bryant was the grandson of a former mayor and had spent his boyhood in a world of privilege. But by his teens, the family's fortune had been wiped out. At Suwannee, Thornton and Bryant became fast friends. They were like brothers. There was a real kind of entrenched and uh, enmeshed relationship between the two. And many people uh, differed as to who was the leader there. Some people insisted that Bradley Bryant called the shots, and others said, absolutely not, it was Drew Thornton. After graduating from Suwannee, both Thornton and Bryant entered the military. Thornton thrived on danger and found his niche as an army paratrooper. 
He was wounded in the Dominican Republic when American troops were sent to put down an uprising. Thornton was awarded a Purple Heart and in 1965 returned to Lexington. Bryant had joined the Marines, but during his tour of duty never saw battle. When Bryant returned home to Lexington, he and Thornton resumed their close friendship. Each was in his mid-twenties, newly married and full of ambition. Thornton worked in the family horse business, but life on the farm was too tame for him. He parachuted as a hobby, got his pilot's license, but he was growing increasingly restless. Life was just kind of boring compared to, you know, all this preparation for war and then a little bit of war and then, you know, to come back. He was really looking for war on the streets of, of America. In 1968, Thornton joined the Lexington police just as it was beginning to tackle the drug problems brought on by the emerging youth culture. If you were going to be with the police force and you wanted some action and excitement and activity, I mean, where you needed to be was on the narcotics unit. Andrew Thornton was one of the first officers to volunteer. The narc unit satisfied his need for thrills and power. Soon he met other like-minded young recruits. Among them, Henry Vance, a Kentucky blue blood who also hailed from one of the oldest and most esteemed families in Lexington. Good, hard-working, church-going, God-fearing, citizen, civic-minded, um, you know, perfect citizens, the kind of people you want your town to be, to be uh, full of. In school, Vance was an average student but his charm, charisma, and pedigree made him stand out. In Lexington, those were important assets. Vance went to college and then law school, but the curriculum proved too difficult, and he dropped out after a year. By 1969, he was married and needed a job. His well-connected father came to the rescue. His dad asked um, a family friend to give Henry a job, and then Henry got a job on the sheriff's department Vance soon found himself on Lexington's new undercover drug task force, along with Andrew Thornton. The two hit it off right away. Henry has the same kind of makeup as Drew Thornton. Drew Thornton was more masculine and manly than Henry Vance, but, you know, so it was kind of an odd, odd relationship. The seeds of what happened uh, started on that drug task force. Andrew Thornton and Henry Vance, two young men of privilege trained to fight the war on drugs. Before long, these two crime fighters would decide that there was even more of the power and adventure they craved on the other side of the law. Sunday on Impossible Heists. In 1970, rookie police officers Andrew Thornton and Henry Vance were both young men from wealthy Lexington families who were carving out roles in the city's first drug task force. Vance's charm made him a natural. He would be the spokesperson for the squad. Thornton went undercover, setting up buys and gathering information. Their mission was simple, get rid of the drugs in Lexington. But how they did that was up to them. The mentality of a lot of police departments in the late 60s and 70s was influenced tremendously by film and television. And to be a crime fighter was a, was a handle that was more preferred than to be a person who resolved issues in a community to prevent crime. Crime fighter denotes action. And the police community uh, is a uh, group that loves action. Lexington's narcotic squad started racking up arrests. It was the first war on drugs, and uh, there weren't a lot of rules. Uh, you know, law enforcement and people in the community didn't know how you were supposed to go about doing this kind of thing. So there was very little monitoring. With no one watching him, Thornton quickly developed a reputation. He was a very brutal officer, and I think he really kind of savored the idea of beating heads together. 
not just tough cops, but renegade cops. And I think that once they were able to get away with some of that, then they increasingly took the law into their own hands. If you go back and look at uh, some documents, you will even sense that there were a number of people who thought that they might be planting drugs on people to arrest them. But it didn't stop there. The Lexington cop had broken his oath to protect the public and had become a drug dealer himself. Drew Thornton would steal the marijuana that he confiscated from somebody and then it would suddenly disappear out of the evidence locker and then he would sell it again. Thornton didn't need the money. He had plenty of his own, but he did need the excitement of getting away with a crime. There was this kind of, nobody can catch me and I'm smarter than everyone and I'm braver than everyone. With this entire group, you know, they truly lived life as if no one could control them. That, that the end justified the means and that they were going to do exactly what they wanted to, when they wanted to, in the way they wanted to, and that nobody, uh, nobody could try to stop that. Thornton's buddy, Henry Vance, was making a few illegal sales of his own, but he wasn't as slick as Thornton. Vance was caught forging the sheriff's signature on an order for 25 revolvers. In May 1973, the sheriff fired him. Getting caught forging your boss's signature and then lying about it might have put an end to the average person's career, but it didn't hurt Henry Vance's. Within a year, he was able to use his connections to land a job in the Kentucky State Legislature. I don't think there's any question through his family and his, uh, their connections with certain people in politics that he was able to get some advantages that other people would not have had the opportunity for. While Vance and Thornton were abusing their power and the public trust in Lexington, Thornton's old military school friend Bradley Bryant had moved east in search of great wealth. Bradley Bryant made some connections with some businessmen in Philadelphia, a multimillionaire, and brought Bradley in. That was really, I think, when Bradley was kind of introduced to a higher stratum. Bryant's life on Philadelphia's ritzy main line brought him more luxury and affluence than he had ever known. He and his wife made frequent trips from their home in Philadelphia to Las Vegas, where his brother-in-law was a big shot at the casinos. Bryant became a fixture in Vegas, rubbing elbows with high rollers and local mobsters. He had finally found the opulence and flash he was looking for. That's where Bradley Bryant made the connections for drug trafficking, where he was introduced to uh, people who were capable of importing huge loads of, of everything, marijuana, cocaine, heroin. Separately, Bryant and his old friend Andrew Thornton were now both seeing the world of drug dealing up close. Thornton on the distribution end in Lexington, Bryant on the supply end in Las Vegas. And they were both hungry. Bryant for big money and Thornton for risk and adventure. The drug business offered all of that. In 1975, Thornton and Bryant joined forces. They formed Executive Protection, a private security service. Publicly, it was a legitimate company providing bodyguards for Bryant's Vegas friends. Executive Protection had a handful of clients. They had a couple of, of contacts and contracts that were lucrative early on. But secretly, Executive Protection was the cover under which Thornton and Bryant could acquire weapons and begin to run their smuggling business. What these people began to do uh, was get involved in transporting on a large scale uh, cocaine and marijuana. I mean, planes full, uh, truckloads, that sort of thing. Using their business as a front, Brian and Thornton began to piece together a drug and weapons smuggling operation that would eventually span two continents, move tons of marijuana and cocaine, and make millions of dollars. And with the help of some friends in high places, it would be years before anybody in Lexington knew what was going on. All allergies. They thought no one was watching. They were wrong. Get the cops back. 
You never know who will take the bait. The picture's worth a thousand words. Caught. We'll be watching. Next, right here on Court TV. In 1975, Andrew Thornton and Bradley Bryant were creating the largest drug smuggling operation in Kentucky's history. By then, Thornton's crony from the drug squad, Henry Vance, was in a key job at the Kentucky State Legislature. Thornton's nickname for the threesome was The Company. Bryant was the businessman. His relationships were the big money, Vegas, politics. Thornton was in charge of transportation and logistics. Drew provided aircraft. He provided the landing strip so that they had safe harbor and safe haven in Kentucky to import loads. Vance was at the state capitol and would have the inside track on any potential investigations. Because of Thornton and Vance's uh, experience in law enforcement, they had a lot of friends not only in the Lexington Police Department but in, in other federal agencies, particularly DEA. The method was simple. Bryant would lease small planes through the front company, Executive Protection. Thornton would fly at night to remote locations around Kentucky to meet his contact. He would load the plane with bales of marijuana and then return to Lexington's Bluegrass Airport, where the dope would be distributed to dealers. They would have offload people, you know, people that would meet the airplane coming in and they had, you know, a truck and offloaded the drugs and, and transported it to another location. They had mechanics who were available to take care of the planes. It could be done without detection. There was no process for officials at the airport to notify police of any suspicious planes landing. Within two years, the company was a full-fledged smuggling operation, reportedly bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of marijuana annually. Remember, Thornton was a Lexington cop. He knew exactly how to exploit the weaknesses of the police force without being detected. The only problem for Thornton was that he didn't know when to stop. There was a uh, kind of a need to be um, larger than life, a need to be the guy who was in the know. And, you know, he loved the kind of covert and secretive. He was also driven by money and power. And certainly, you know, selling drugs was a place to get that. By January 1977, Thornton was abandoning the last vestiges of his life as a Lexington police officer. He resigned from the force. His transformation from law enforcement to drug outlaw was now complete. Thornton maintained close ties with Henry Vance. Vance ascended to administrative assistant to the governor of Kentucky, Julian Carroll. Vance basked in the power that came with his position. He was just a mean, cold uh, arrogance, I guess is the best word to really describe him. And yet he would work for the governor and work for the Speaker of the House. And he was well-dressed, well looked good, I mean, until you, you talk to him. You know, he drove a little gray Mercedes, two-door Mercedes convertible and, you know, kind of ran around political circles. There was a ruthlessness to him that was certainly um, not obvious on the surface. Vance was Thornton's eyes and ears in the governor's office, but he chose to maintain a clean public face. Vance was seldom seen together with his drug-dealing buddy, and he had good reason. By spring 1977, Lexington was buzzing with rumors about Thornton, whispers of blackmail and smuggling, and most disturbing, the disappearance of a young woman. Melanie Flynn was the 24-year-old girlfriend of Bill Canan. Canan was one of Thornton's cronies from the Lexington Narcotics Squad and a member of the company. One day, um, left her office to meet her family at, for a family gathering and made a turn uh, onto a main road, and that was the last time anybody ever saw her. Those who investigated the disappearance from the earliest 
moment knew that there had been foul play. You know, she might have had information about um, the drug trafficking, and clearly somebody, I believe, wanted to get her out of the way. Melanie Flynn had spent a lot of time with Thornton and his associates. It wasn't a stretch to believe that she might have overheard things that she wasn't supposed to. There was no body found. I would speculate that she probably knew too much about uh, Thornton's activities. It was as if she vanished into thin air, and that only added to Drew Thornton's growing reputation. By mid-1978, Thornton's partner Bradley Bryant was ready to launch the company into the drug smuggling big leagues. He brought international drug kingpins Lee and Jimmy Chagra into the fold. The Chagra organization was the supplier. I mean, they had direct connections to the, you know, the Colombian cartel and heroin through the Mideast. And um, I mean, they were the ones who had the, the drug connection and uh, Bradley and Drew had the distribution system. But the Chagras were being investigated by the Justice Department, and Thornton didn't want federal eyes focusing on the company. And that was one of the first areas of conflict between Bradley Bryant and Drew Thornton, that um, Drew really did not want Bradley to um, let the Chagra network join their, their own organization. But Bradley Bryant was determined and eventually convinced Thornton that a partnership with the Chagras was the key to expanding their operation beyond Kentucky. Thornton may have gone along with Bryant's plan, but he wasn't happy about partnering with the Chagra brothers. It wouldn't take long before the Chagras and their violent ways would start to tear the company apart and put it on everyone's most wanted list. Heists, a luxury yacht, a Picasso up for grabs as Red Battles Blue for $100,000 in cash. Blow it. Impossible Heists, Sunday at 11 on Court TV. In late 1978, Andrew Thornton and Bradley Bryant were preparing for their biggest venture to date flying 20,000 pounds of high-grade marijuana from Columbia into Lexington with their new partners, drug traffickers Lee and Jimmy Chagra. The Chagras had been under investigation by federal prosecutors for over a year, and the evidence against them was mounting. Thornton and Bryant knew how cold-blooded their Las Vegas partners were, but even they couldn't have seen what was coming next. On November 21st, gunmen opened fire on the prosecutor who was investigating the Chagras, James Kerr, as he was sitting in his car. Incredibly, Kerr escaped unharmed. Then, a month later, Lee Chagra was shot to death in his office by an unknown assailant. The high-profile attacks ratcheted up the pressure on an already risky smuggling deal. Against Thornton's instincts, the company went ahead with the Colombian job. On January 10th, 1979, Thornton flew the company's DC-4 airplane into the jungles of South America. He returned to Lexington the next night with 10 tons of marijuana, worth almost $2 million. Thornton landed the plane at Bluegrass Airport, where his crew, led by a man named Mike Kelly, unloaded the cargo. Thornton then had the plane flown to a small airfield outside Louisville, where it was abandoned. I remember being a police reporter and hearing um, the, the traffic on the police radio one night um, that, you know, federal authorities had seized a plane at Bowman Field in Louisville. Authorities determined that the DC-4 was registered to Bradley Bryant, and when they discovered marijuana residue inside, they turned it over to the DEA. But once in the hands of the DEA, the investigation ground to a halt. The state police began to suspect that the DEA was protecting the company. And we are convinced they were being given cover by the person in charge of the DEA for Kentucky, uh, Harold Brown. There were memorandums from our investigating uh, people out in western Kentucky that says, every time we begin to do something, we look up and here's Harold Brown. 
But Brown had an answer for everything. Brown's uh, explanation was that Thornton was an informant, but uh, there was a lot of questions about that relationship. One month after the DC-4 was seized, Jimmy Chagro was indicted on federal drug charges in El Paso. On the day that Chagra's trial was set to begin, the presiding judge, John Wood, was shot dead as he reached for the door of his Cadillac. That became the most celebrated criminal case in America. At the time, FBI teletypes went out to every law enforcement agency to try and solve this case. It was astonishing. The first time in almost 100 years that a federal judge had been assassinated. The Chagra organization had graduated to a whole new level of lawlessness and put all of their associates, including the company, under a magnifying glass. We would receive uh, leads for background information on all the individuals that were suspected initially in that case. So there was uh, activity like that all over the United States, running down leads, associates, anything at all connected with the Chagras. Andrew Thornton's concern about partnering with the Chagras proved to be well-founded. As soon as the judge was hit, everybody became very paranoid. Drew felt that he was right and vindicated in not having wanted to hook up with the Chagra organization. Thornton met with Bryant and told him it was time to break with the Chagra organization. But Bryant shocked Thornton when he told him that not only did he not want to break with the Chagras, he wanted to take over their entire network in South America. For Thornton, it was the last straw. At this point, there was a split between them. And that's when uh, Drew went off on his own. And Bradley, meanwhile, started a new drug smuggling organization. Bradley Bryant wasn't going to let the murder of a federal judge get in his way. He was planning his most audacious operation yet. Bryant had a cousin with a high-level security clearance at the China Lake Naval Base in California. In late summer, he convinced his cousin to steal equipment from the base, including night vision scopes and 1,500 rounds of ammunition. Bryant stored some of the weapons in a Lexington warehouse. He flew the rest to Columbia and traded them for cocaine. Bryant was operating on his own now, without the support of Thornton and without contact from Henry Vance. Henry Vance was busy exercising his power behind the scenes at the Kentucky State Capitol. He had become an assistant to the Speaker of the House and was always careful to protect his image as a committed public servant. Henry Vance kept a very low profile when he was working with the state government. He had knowledge of all their activities pretty much, so he had a lot to lose. But Henry Vance remained cocky and ruthless. And when things started going south for his buddies Bryant and Thornton, he would do anything to save his own skin, no matter how deadly. The man. The company had split, and Bradley Bryant was planning to make millions on his own trading stolen weapons for cocaine. In January 1980, a maid in a Philadelphia hotel smelled marijuana coming from a room. The hotel's manager called the police. The Philadelphia police came there thinking that they were just pot smokers or whatever. But when they went into the room, they found things that made it clear that they were onto something much larger. Police found a ledger with a list of names and phone numbers, a telephone scrambling device, $25,000 in cash, semi-automatic weapons, and a lease to a warehouse in Lexington. They determined that the room had been paid for by Bradley Bryant. Bryant was nowhere to be found, but his finely tuned operation was starting to unravel. The police tracked him to the Philadelphia airport. He was arrested as he was attempting to board a flight to Atlanta. Now here's a guy who's been smuggling weapons and drugs back and forth from South America, evading arrest for years. But when he got caught, who busted him? A hotel maid. Maybe he should have been a better tipper. The Philadelphia authorities turned over the warehouse lease to the Lexington police. 
and they went down there with ATF and raided the warehouse and found equipment in there that had come from China Lake. Inside was an arsenal of weapons worth $250,000, including a 50 caliber anti-aircraft gun and 21 taser stun guns. Police also found a military-issue night vision scope, traceable to the China Lake Naval Base in California. Bryant was charged with possession of unregistered weapons and then released on a $50,000 bond. Bryant's arrest caught the city by surprise. What's going on under our very noses that we don't know about? It was, it was shock. It was total shock. It was something like... Now, if that can happen in Lexington, what is happening in the rest of the world? People at first didn't believe it. It just sounded like, well, maybe they're not really involved in it. That's somebody else in another country. Or could this be one of our own? Bryant stood trial in Lexington in spring 1980. The evidence against him seemed overwhelming. After three weeks, the jury read their verdict. He was acquitted at that trial. Everyone was astounded at that verdict, including the judge. Unbelievable. The cops had found a warehouse full of weapons, and the jury let Bryant walk. But Bryant was about to hand the feds exactly what they were looking for. In May 1981, Bryant tried to sell 800 pounds of marijuana to undercover DEA agents in Illinois. He was arrested on the spot. Once in custody, Bryant was also indicted in California for possession of the stolen China Lake equipment and conspiracy to distribute marijuana. These are drug dealers, and they were stealing items that they could trade drugs for. Bryant pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Sally Denton was a correspondent for Lexington Television and covered the story. I mean, when I came to Kentucky, to Lexington, and began, you know, kind of doing investigative reporting on this story, I was shocked at how little there was available anywhere, and shocked particularly at, you know, how little curiosity there seemed to be about it. In their zeal to get Bryant, authorities have also been turning up the heat on many of his known and alleged associates, including a number of men from central Kentucky. Andrew Thornton was also indicted as a result of the Bryant investigation. The feds charged him with conspiring to import and distribute marijuana. But the former cop couldn't tolerate the thought of being locked up and wasn't going to take a chance with a trial. In late summer of 1981, Thornton disappeared, but the story was spreading. The Philadelphia investigation of Bradley Bryant quickly mushroomed as evidence of his involvement with the company surfaced. The infamous paramilitary narcotics group is said to be the largest guns for drugs network ever to be uncovered in the U.S. I can't ever recall this kind of daily or weekly or monthly revelations of all this international drug and gun smuggling. And here we are sitting around saying, but it's not real it's not this is not true and it was the noose was getting tighter and henry vance then a top aide to the kentucky speaker of the house was scared he had good reason one of the company's smuggling cronies a man who could connect vance to thornton and bryant was in a jam that man was mike kelly Mike Kelly had also grown up in Lexington. He was the company's electronics expert and had been an offloader in the January 1979 marijuana deal. Mike Kelly was in jail in Florida looking at a very serious sentence on marijuana importation charge. And Vance feared that he was getting ready to make a deal with that prosecutor. And if he did, he was gonna, they thought, I believe, uh, spill the beans on all their activities. Kelly was being pressured by prosecutor Eugene Barry to give up his accomplices. But according to FBI agent Jim Huggins, Vance had a solution, and it involved Mike Kelly's wife, Bonnie. Henry's uh, convinced Bonnie Kelly uh, to go to Florida, kill the prosecutor. He furnished the murder weapon, told her where and how to shoot the prosecutor, what to do with the weapon, to help set up an alibi for her. He was involved from the very beginning, planning the entire operation she drove up and wearing a disguise drove up to eugene berry's house one night and he was sitting um with his wife watching tv and he went to the door 
and Bonnie blew him away. Bonnie Kelly left Eugene Barry lying in a pool of blood on the floor of his house. During her getaway, Kelly tossed the gun that Vance had given her into a canal. She called back to Lexington from Florida and, and basically gave the message that it's, it's done. Vance had even cooked up an alibi for Bonnie. The story was that he and Bonnie had seen each other in Lexington the night the prosecutor was shot in Florida. Vance, who had always landed on his feet, figured they had nothing to worry about. He was wrong. Florida investigators started looking at who are the people that would likely want Mr. Barry killed, and they started looking at Mike Kelly's associates, and it all came right back to Andrew Thornton, Henry Vance, Mike Kelly. And they focused in on Bonnie Kelly right away, and it didn't take very long to do some very good investigation on Florida's part to uh, have her arrested. Bonnie Kelly was convicted of the murder of Eugene Barry and sentenced to life in prison. Throughout it all, Kelly refused to give up any information about the company or Henry Vance. Henry Vance and these people were operating here in central Kentucky and their tentacles were spreading throughout the country. And we were looking for every opportunity to, uh, to do something constructive about that. It was really a sense of frustration to know that they were pretty much getting away with it. Vance thought he was safe from the feds. And Thornton believed he had outsmarted them. Since 1981, he had been flying from hideout to hideout all over the country. But Thornton and Vance's luck was about to run out. They thought... Andrew Thornton was a fugitive from justice. Thornton was wanted on drug smuggling charges and had managed to evade capture for six months by flying around the country in his small twin-engine plane. But in January 1982, customs agents intercepted a radio transmission from Thornton. He was nabbed by local police at a North Carolina airfield while servicing his plane. In June, Thornton was convicted of conspiracy to import marijuana, but Thornton's sentence was a slap on the wrist, six months with time off for good behavior. He served five months of a six-month drug sentence at the local federal prison. Thornton's quick stint in prison didn't teach him much. In fact, during that time, he was plotting the biggest deals of his life. For Andrew Thornton, doing time was really just an interruption in his busy schedule. Well, when Drew was released from prison, then once again, he goes right back into the drug smuggling operation. That's when he started making his connections in South America. Still, the Justice Department had no proof of any further smuggling activity. And for a while, Thornton fell off their radar. But he was never out of the drug business. And in 1985, the FBI received a tip Thornton was involved in a cocaine smuggling operation, and uh, based on informant information, we had opened a case. He got right in next to Colombian cocaine cartel. He had an unlimited supply of cocaine that he could bring in, and he was really even bigger than he had ever been before. Over the next few months, Thornton was planning his operation, but he didn't know that federal agencies were watching him. In mid-September, Thornton piloted a plane to South America. Some say that this last flight of his was really going to be the last flight, that this was, you know, he, his personal take in it. Thornton flew his twin-engine Cessna from Lexington to Columbia. He loaded it up with 200 pounds of cocaine, worth over $37 million. Thornton then headed back to the United States. He thought he was home free. But according to Sally Denton, federal agents were tracking Thornton. He was being followed. They were on him, and he knew they were on him. Thornton panicked. He decided to avoid capture by ditching the plane. But he wanted to save his cargo. Thornton switched to autopilot and started dumping duffel bags of coke from the aircraft. He then strapped the last 80-pound duffel bag to himself, put on his parachute, and jumped into the sky, just as he had a thousand times before.
His body was discovered in a Tennessee driveway the following morning. My first thought was surprise that he wasn't successful because he knew what he was doing. So then we began to all speculate, okay, did he get hit by part of the aircraft? Did he, was he unconscious? Did the shoot just not work? No one ever determined what went wrong on Andrew Thornton's final jump. But one thing was now undeniable. Any question of, of what Drew Thornton's activities were, it was no longer a question in 1985 because he fell from the sky with 80 pounds of cocaine strapped to his waist. Andrew Thornton was now dead. Bradley Bryant was in jail. The company was no more. But for Henry Vance, the one remaining member of this unholy trinity, the story wasn't over. In December 1986, Bonnie Kelly was in jail for the murder of Eugene Barry, a murder that FBI agent Jim Huggins suspected Vance ordered and provided the gun for. The five-year statute of limitations for bringing charges against Vance was just weeks away from expiring. It looked like Vance was going to get away with his charade as a committed public servant. Special Agent Huggins knew he had one shot to bring Henry Vance to justice for good. Bonnie Kelly refused to talk to anyone in Florida, so I decided to go down with another agent and convince her to talk to us. And she decided that uh, this was, as she said later, this was a way that she had of dealing with what she had done. In January 1987, Kelly's story was presented to a jury. She testified that Vance had masterminded the whole thing and had given her the gun to kill the prosecutor. That was enough to indict Henry Vance for providing the weapon used in the murder of Eugene Barry. But Huggins still needed the gun as evidence, the gun that Bonnie Kelly had thrown into a canal five years earlier. With her help, we went out looking for the murder weapon, and uh, she took us to a canal that she believed she had thrown this weapon the night of the murder. So we employed a salvage operator who had an electromagnet, took the magnet out to the place where Bonnie had told us she had thrown the weapon, and on the very first dip into the water with this thing, we found it. Really just amazing. After five years, to be able to come up with that. Vance was convicted in October 1987 and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But even with a guilty verdict, the ties of the Kentucky Old Boy Network stayed strong. It was absolutely amazing the number of prominent people in Kentucky, including the former governor, wrote letters to the judge asking for leniency for this man and saying that they thought he was a pillar of the community and what a great person he was. And here's a guy that actually plans the murder of a prosecutor. He's just a uh, cold-blooded criminal. At Vance's sentencing, the network of drug and weapon smugglers that was known as The Company was exposed. The federal judge named everyone, and Drew Thornton, uh, Henry, and said, you all are like birds of a feather, and you've been committing these criminal acts for years, and you're judged by the company you keep. The judge kind of all brought it together. The most dangerous thing that happened in Lexington, Kentucky in those days was that the guardians of the estate were asleep at the job. I think the sad thing about this entire story is that here's a group of people that had every advantage that they could possibly want. They could have been anything. They could have been successful and could have made their lives and the lives of everyone else around them know. Uh, very uplifting, but they chose to go the other route and they brought a lot of uh, sadness. They brought a lot of destruction. Bryant and Vance did their time and are now out of prison. Andrew Thornton, international drugs and arms smuggler, was worth only $82,000 at the time of his death. He left the bulk of his estate to Henry Vance. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. They thought no one was watching. They were wrong. You never know who will take the bait. The picture's worth a thousand words. Caught. We'll be watching. Now, right here on Court TV.